Okay, so welcome to this next video on skeletal muscle contraction. Okay, so we're in the process of discussing this interaction between the dihydropyridine receptor, or L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, and the reanidine receptor 1. And basically, what actually happens is if you look at how these dihydropyridine receptors and reanidine receptors are um, located, basically. What you get is a picture that looks something like this. So, if we imagine just looking at the positions of the channels, then if I denote the reanidine receptors by these big squares, what you find is that they have a pattern like this. So, what I'm now looking at is if I, if you imagine sticking in a plane in between here, I'm basically looking down on that plane. So imagine sticking in a plane like that in between these two, uh, these, the, the surface of the um, T tubule membrane and the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. And I'm just looking at the positions of these reanidine receptors. So here is basically a reanidine receptor consisting of these four massive subunits, like so. And here is another reanidine receptor here, consisting of these four massive subunits. And they basically form these massive great lattices on the surface of the uh, sarcoplasmic reticular membranes. So here's another reanidine receptor of the type, first type. And there'll be another one like that. And you can continue the pattern, hopefully. Right, okay. And now... If we look at where the uh, dihydropyridine receptors are positioned with respect to this, so these are all in this membrane here, but facing onto them will be this uh, T-tubule membrane, and in that T-tubule membrane will be these dihydropyridine receptors. So basically, the dihydropyridine receptors will be here. Okay, so again, they're, they're a little poor with four domains. So here we go. Here is the dihydropyridine receptor. And they're tiny compared to these um, compared to these reanidine receptors, which are enormous. Okay, so basically what you have is you have alternating reanidine and dihydropyridine receptors. And this is how you have these interactions between the reanidine receptors and the dihydropyridine receptors. So this is how they are positioned with respect to each other, basically. So these ones, remember, are in this sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane, and these ones are in this um, are in this T-tubule sarcolemma membrane, uh, but they're physically connected, and they a change in the conformation of these, which causes them to open, is communicated to a change in these, and that causes these reanidine receptors to open. So this is the type 1 reanidine receptor. Type 1 reanidine receptor. And um, the other receptor is the dihydropyridine receptor. So this is the dihydropyridine receptor, uh, which I'll just abbreviate to DHPR. Okay, right. So um, now what has happened is that these reanidine receptors uh, of the first type have opened. So the uh, voltage across the sarcolemma changed, uh, it depolarized, that caused the dihydropyridine receptor to adopt an open conformation, which has then caused these type 1 reanidine receptors to adopt an open conformation. Okay, now let's have a look at the structure of a type 1 reanidine receptor. So basically, if we look at um, a type 1 reanidine receptor, if we look at this here, then um, if you look at the structure of the pore, this is what you find. You find a wide bit and then a narrow bit, like so. Okay? And the narrow bit is the selectivity filter of this channel. Okay, so uh, channels, uh, ion channels always usually have selectivity filters, uh, which make sure that only the ion which this channel wants to conduct can actually go through it. So this here, this narrow portion, is the selectivity filter of our reanidine receptor. Selectivity filter. And basically, the selectivity filter is on the luminal side, so it's facing the inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So basically, this is the inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and this is the cytoplasm, or sarcoplasma, because it's a skeletal muscle cell. Okay, so, uh, basically, when this channel opens, uh, the calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum will go through the, uh, s uh, the selectivity filter of this channel and it will leave uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum and go into uh, the cytoplasm or the sarcoplasm. 
Right. Now, the first thing to say is that the there is no electrical potential difference across the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane. So the electrical potential in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the same as the electrical p uh, p uh, potential in the sarcoplasm. So there isn't an electrical driving force driving calcium out. What there is, is a concentration gradient. So there is a lot of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and there is not much calcium let me just finish this picture. There is not much calcium in the cytoplasm. So there is a concentration gradient which is going to favour the movement of calcium out. But there isn't an electrical gradient. Okay, the second thing to say is that this selectivity filter of uh, the uh, dihydropyridine receptor is actually not that selective. It also allows potassium ions to move through it, basically. So calcium moves through it, but Potassium can also move through it, and that low selectivity of the um, of this uh, type one reanidine receptor, you might think that that's not good, but in fact it actually works to its advantage because this selectivity filter is actually very very wide compared to normal selectivity filters, and this wideness is why uh, the it isn't particularly selective. But the wideness works to the channel's advantage because it means that it can conduct calcium quicker. And when we're talking about skeletal muscle, we need very quick transient rises in calcium to cause contraction transiently. And then we need calcium to drop back down again. So we need to be able to release calcium very quickly. And since we haven't got an electrical gradient driving calcium out, we need a nice high low resistance um, uh, a nice wide low resistance uh, channel basically and that uh, wide selectivity filter is helpful for that. Secondly, the fact that it's not selective and that it allows potassium to come in is actually really important and the reason is this, if you were just allowing calcium to leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum and go into the cytoplasm, what would happen? Well, calcium has a positive charge on it. It has a it's divalent cation on it. It has two positive charges on it. So when you moved calcium, you'd gradually make the cytoplasm more positive, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, lumen would become more negative, and that electrical gradient would start stopping the calcium from being able to move. The calcium would want to stay in the sarcoplasmic reticulum because the sarcoplasmic reticulum had a negative charge. Okay, so it's thought that potassium, this permeability to potassium, actually is really important for acting basically as a counter ion. So when calcium is moving out, you're gradually building up a positive charge in the cytoplasm and a negative charge inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What will happen is that potassium will come back into the cytoplasm and neutralize this negative charge here and uh, neutralize the positive charge here, so it will neutralize the electrical potential that you're going to build up otherwise. Uh, electrical potential difference that you're going to build up otherwise. So it's thought that potassium acts as the counter ion to calcium in this movement, basically, uh, through the uh, reanidine type 1 receptor. Okay, right. So, now let's discuss what the rise in calcium in the sarcoplasm actually causes. Mm -hmm. So, the type 1 reanidine receptor has opened. Calcium is now going to leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum and calcium is going to go up in uh, the sarcoplasm, basically. Uh, potassium is going to move back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to act as the counter ion for the movement of calcium out. Okay, so now we are at the point of calcium going up in the cytoplasm. And how does that calcium going up in the cytoplasm actually lead to the contraction of the skeletal muscle? Okay, right. And to understand this, we need to go back to our structure of a sarcomere. So, let's draw out a sarcomere here. So here's one of these uh, Z discs here. Here's another Z disc here. And now, here are the actin filaments, so I'll, move, I'll put some actin filaments attached to these Z-discs and stretching this way. And then from this Z-disc, we'll have actin filaments stretching the other way. But of course, both of these Z-discs would have actin filaments stretching both way, ways. It's just we're looking, we're looking at a single sarcomere at the moment. Okay, so here are the actin filaments. So I'll give them, just label them. And remember, those are polymers of the actin monomer. Loads and loads of actin monomers stuck together, basically. 
and these structures here are proteinaceous and they're the Z discs which attach the actin um, and hold them in this structure. Right, we've also then got another disc here which is attaching the myosin filaments. So off of this disc comes the myosin filaments which are going to basically overlap with the actin filaments. And these myosin filaments, remember, are again polymers of the myosin monomer. And the myosin monomer has two portions. It has a fibrous portion, which uh, all attach together to make this myosin filament here. And then it has a globular head, which sticks out the side. So I'll show one of these. Um, yes, let's show it here. Here is the fibrous portion, which is sort of uh, contributing to this uh, myosin filament structure here. And then sticking out from the myosin filament, you then have the myosin head. Okay, and basically what the myosin head is going to do is it's going to climb up this actin filament when it receives the calcium signal. Okay, so what we need to look at is how does calcium actually uh, activate this climbing up? Okay, so um, basically what calcium does is it does not actually go and activate the myosin head. Instead, what it does is it inactivates the inactivation of the myosin in the heads, if you like. So, uh, basically, if I draw out an actin filament, because it's useful, uh, I'll draw out an actin filament. So this is a pol pol polymerization of the actin monomers. So loads and loads of actin monomers stuck together. Basically, the myosin head wants to bind to uh, binding sites that are on the actin monomers. However, it's prevented from doing so. Usually, in the resting state of skeletal muscle, the myosin head is prevented from binding uh, to the myosin binding site on the actin monomers by a protein which wraps around the actin filaments. So uh, this is a protein that's wrapping around the actin filaments like that. And that green protein is a protein known as tropomyosin. Okay, so tropomyosin is a protein which basically wraps around these actin filaments, like so. So here it is, wrapping around these uh, actin filaments. And basically it blocks the myosin binding sites of the actin uh, monomers and stops the myosin heads from being able to bind to uh, the actin monomers. Now, there is another important protein, which I will denote by a little circle and I'll colour it in a certain colour. Uh, which binds to tropomyosin, and this protein is known as troponin, and we'll study troponin in more detail later. Um, but uh, for now, this is troponin here, and it's bound to the tropomyosin, and basically uh, troponin determines uh, the position of the tropomyosin uh, protein, uh, which is wrapped around the actin filament. So, when calcium goes up in the cytoplasm, what calcium does is it binds to these troponin proteins. And when it binds to the troponin proteins, it changes the conformation of the tropomyosin protein. And when the tropomyosin protein changes conformation, it makes available the myosin binding sites on the actin monomers. So now if I draw the actin filament here, like so, uh, then basically we can imagine that the tropomyosin has now changed conformation so that it's not in the way anymore of uh, the myosin heads trying to bind to the actin filaments. And that is because troponin has changed conformation because of the calcium binding to it. So troponin actually has one of these EF hand uh, domains uh, for binding calcium. Okay, so this is troponin and it has now changed conformation because it has bound calcium. Right. Okay, so when troponin changes conformation, it makes available, uh, well, it moves tropomyosin, and tropomyosin changing conformation makes available these myosin head binding sites on the actin monomers, and we'll continue this discussion in the next.